Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the annual Autism Awareness Lecture, which happens every April as part of Autism Awareness Month. This particular lecture is being brought to you by uh, NIH and the Office of Autism, or NIMH, I should say, and the Autism, the Office of Autism Research Coordination, or OARC, which Susan Daniels, who's here, runs. And um, along with many other things that they do, uh, this lecture is one of the annual events that we look forward to. This year, we're particularly delighted to have uh, an outstanding uh, science, scientist who's going to take us through uh, his particular story, uh, both personal and professional, related to autism. Kevin Pelfrey, uh, born in Kentucky, part of a military family raised in North Carolina, uh, ultimately went to UNC to get his PhD in cognitive uh, and developmental um, psychology, and then went on and got a cognitive neuroscience um, postdoc uh, at Duke, where he finally began to bring together these two interests, both a uh, modern cognitive neuroscience, especially social neuroscience, and an opportunity to think uh, very carefully about development and how the developing brain begins to process social information. His work has been a model for many people in how to use neuroimaging and cognition together to understand social information processing. And you'll hear much more about that in just a few minutes from him. He's currently the director of the Yale Center for Translational Developmental Neuroscience, which I think captures just about everything that um, he would want to say he's interested in. He's received um, numerous awards um, most of the time while he's been at Yale, where uh, he's also been the Harris Professor in the Child Study Center and the prof a professor of psychology at the uh, Yale School of Medicine. His awards include um, a Career Scientist Award from NIH, the John Merck Scholars Award, and uh, the APA's Boyd McCandless Award for Distinguished Early Career Theoretical Contributions to Developmental Psychology. Uh, he is supported by NIH, including a large um, center grant from NIMH focusing particularly on uh, girls and women on the spectrum, uh, also supported by the Simons Foundation, Autism Speaks, and the NSF. And on a personal level, level I have to say that uh, uh, Kevin has been just one of the great people in this uh, very exciting field of autism research who's uh, been able to talk about this not only from the standpoint of where is the science taking us, but how do we make that science useful? And he cares about that specifically because he's not only a great scientist, but a very committed father uh, to a daughter who's on the spectrum. And that is, I hope, the story that we'll let him tell us about this afternoon. Kevin, welcome, and thanks so much for being here. <clears throat> okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this is the first time I, I've I've really given a talk that's not focused just on science and the data. Um, I am extremely nervous for the first time giving a talk in many, many years because this is really going out on a limb for me, So, but hopefully it won't uh, show very much. Um, and again, I'm honored to be here. This is really terrific. So this is Francis, and Francis was actually born the day I first met Tom Inzel. Um, I don't think he knows that story, but the, the story was um, he was visiting for our START Center. Um, I was working with Joe Piven as a postdoc then at University of North Carolina, and he visited, and I had been given the opportunity to present for three minutes, and many of my colleagues were given the opportunity to present. I was the most junior person presenting, but Joe really wanted me to give me that opportunity, um, and I, you know, ready to do it. So Joe called um, shortly before Francis was born to check to see if I was going to be there the next day and, you know, tell me how important it is. Then he called again to say, I shouldn't have pushed you. If you want to stay, it's totally fine. And then I, um, I quit answering the phone at that point. And then Francis was born and everything was going really well and I was working on my talk in the room and she was sleeping on my, my chest. And then the next morning, um, we were scheduled to be released you know, and, and go home with Francis. And I had to go give this talk. And so we conspired 
to try to stay a little longer so that I could run from Cary, North Carolina to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is about 25 miles, and give my talk. And so <clears throat> my colleagues, being much more senior than I, all ran over, you know, ridiculously so. Um, one senior person who's now a chair of a very prestigious psychiatry department, instead of three minutes, it was 25. And so I'm like, wow, you know, I, I really blew this because I'm going to miss um, seeing my daughter go home. But Tom actually said, well, you know, I, I want to see this because the title was on the social brain. And so they bumped me up and I gave my talk and then I promptly left and went back. And Tom emailed me the next day and asked me for my slides and apparently said something nice about the talk I gave to the chair of the psychiatry department because the next day they offered me an actual faculty position as opposed to, and he cited, you know, that he had talked to Tom and Zillen. So thank you very much. You actually got me my first job. So now when we got back to the hospital, the social worker was very concerned that I wasn't there when it was time for checkout. And so I got quite the lecture from the social worker. But we got Francis home. And you know it was really um, a very, very, very exciting time. Um, Francis had uh, you know, a number of, of, of strange things happen um, during the pregnancy with Francis. Um, some infections, um, she was turned upside down. We did everything we could to move her um, so she was the correct position to be born. She was born by C-section. Um, but for you know, all the world, a very healthy, um, happy little girl, just absolutely delight delightful. And I realized what it felt like when she was born to be willing to take a bullet for somebody. And before then, I you know, just didn't really see the world that way. And I don't think anyone who's not the parent um, especially, I think, the parent of a little girl can really, and I apologize if that's sexist, but um, there are heartstrings that are pulled when you're the father of a little girl um, that I think are um, very, very, very profound and important. So at the time, I was <clears throat> having, you know, doing my career and excited, and it's all the career as, as something very meaningful to me. Um, and I had the opportunity through Joe Piven, um, who's really responsible for getting me into autism research. I had been a basic developmental psychologist, and so I was um, working on building little eye tracking hats that go on babies' heads so I could monitor their point of gaze um, you know, on a television screen, for example, and was very excited about doing this basic developmental work. Um, and then I met Joe, and he talked me into applying that to autism. And so this was actually the first paper published using eye tracking to um, uh, measure point of regard in autism. And it's a, it's a kind of a funny story because one of the reviewers on this was Ami Klen. And I had just absolutely adored Ami Klen. And he was working on the same type of study. And so he actually rapidly sent his in for publication. I reviewed his, and he reviewed mine. Um, I won't say who finished their review first. I was a grad student, so I had more time. But we then simultaneously published in different journals, of course, you know, without the other one knowing we had reviewed. We you know, become apparent as to why he and I both know about each other's review later. So, and we showed, frankly, what any good clinician could tell you about autism, which is that part of it is not making eye contact. It's the little red dots here are where an adult, where several adults with autism actually view the face, uh, preponderance on the mouth or other kind of incidental features versus typically developing adults. Um, which and this is a pattern that emerges even in very, very young infants, they look at mostly the eyes and look down at the mouth every so often. And actually, just as an aside, totally doesn't apply to Frances. She's always made great eye contact, but we'll return to that. Now, the other thing that I had been working on was studying what's come to be called the social brain. Um, and I would, I'm biased, but I would argue that this is one of the most important neuroscience discoveries um, you know, in the past 20 years, kind of fleshing out what is the social brain. This started long before me, but I was able to ride this tide working with um, Greg McCarthy, who's one of the, the earliest investigators to use fMRI to study different aspects of cognitive function. And I came in with an interest in social cognition, and so he and I began to do a lot of work. For example, trying to figure out what parts of the brain process the movements of other people versus the movements of other common objects. And so I really didn't think of this work as being applicable to autism at all. Um, 
and you know, certainly at this point, while we were concerned about different aspects of my daughter's development, um, I really wasn't thinking of putting the two together. And so um, I was very fortunate to publish an early imaging paper showing that this little portion of the temporal lobe was quite specific to processing human actions, and, and later we discovered human intentions. So it's a wonderful building block for understanding other people. And it turns out that it has quite a story in autism. Um, and I'll show you part of that story. So this is simply showing you the double dissociation between um, processing the posterior superior temporal sulcus to the biological stimuli versus the mechanical. And then a nearby area, one of the amazing things about the brain is you can find these nearby areas that do incredibly different things. And this is area MT, which is sensitive to all types of motion. So my point in showing you this is this is where my research was going. Um, and in a parallel universe, I'm dad. And we're worried about our daughter, um, but autism never entered my mind. And we were worried because she wasn't responding to her name very well. You know, as a couple of years went by, um, she seemed not as interested as she should be in her, you know, people around her, um, having a hard time learning to crawl and walk, a lot of developmental delay, a lot of hypotonia, um, some, some aspects with her the way her eyes were developing. So all subtle features. But even though we were in North Carolina, which has fantastic autism services, no doctor was saying, this might be autism, right? And I'm working with one of the best doctors in the world, Joe Piven. But in my head, you know, keep business and family separate. And you know, so I, I actually never asked Joe you know, what he thought or to, to look at Francis. Sometimes when your mentor, um, you know, you just don't feel comfortable doing that. I've gotten over that, but um, so we didn't. And you know, time went on, time went on. So I had great opportunities as a result of, of having the opportunities with Joe Piven and Greg McCarthy. And thanks to Tom for suggesting um, somebody should hire me. And so I had the opportunity to move to Duke. Um, I'd done my postdoc between Duke and Carolina, so I had um, Lots of uh, uh, strong opinions about basketball. And by the way, my cousin played for Kentucky the year that Duke and Kentucky played. Most of you in the room have probably seen the tape over and over again on ESPN Classics of my cousin standing flat-footed while Christian Leitner shoots it over his head. So I felt the need to go to Duke and, and save my family's name. And so I went to Duke as an assistant professor. And I started doing um, this work. And that's when the kind of family, um, Francis, and, and the, the saga with Francis really came into being. At one point um, in the school systems in North Carolina, even though they have access to teach and some really state-of-the-art science, they weren't um, up to par for my daughter. And it ended, for me, um, in them suggesting she go into kind of a behaviorally handicapped um, isolation, uh, isolated room, separate from, from the regular classroom. And me arguing, well, you know, I don't, don't, I don't really see this. And we didn't have an autism diagnosis. And so it was really just developmental delay. And she wasn't going to get any of the types of services that she needed. And I knew from my developmental psychology training and my clinical friends that she needed things that were like what a child with autism needs. And she certainly wasn't going to get that um, with what they were proposing to us. And so at about that time, and this is pictures of Francis. It isn't often that you get to show pictures of you know, the, the, the love of your life. And so here she, here she is. Um, that's me when I had more hair. Um, and uh, yeah. And I should say. One of the things that was going on with Francis um, is a lot of collecting behavior. And so a couple of funny anecdotes about that. One is that she became, she loved the Teletubbies for a while. And that was, that was kind of a miserable period. Um, but she was, I said in passing that there was a brown Teletubby. She asked me about the different colors of Teletubbies. And I just read them off. And there isn't a brown Teletubby. But she heard dad say there's a brown Teletubby. And so there's a brown Teletubby. 
And I drove around to every place on the planet looking for something that kind of resembled a brown Teletubby. And then I got a yellow one, and I dyed it brown with the, um, the uh, fabric dye that you can get in the washer, and subsequently dyed every other piece of clothing in the house brown because I didn't know like, how to get it. Um, my wife is, is shaking her, her head because she knows I can't do laundry. Um, so she had a brown Teletubby, and her dad had brown hands all the way up to here. And she walked around. Um, at that point, she was talking a little bit, um, and she would say, Coco, Coco, and show it to everybody um, because she asked me what the Teletubby's name was, and I said, Coco. So that was um, a lot of hoarding behavior, and you can kind of see this here. Um, the social aspect of Francis, that's not where you think autism. It's really the insistence on sameness, the emotion regulation difficulties, the, um, the collecting. And, you know, her first word actually was the result of um, she and I would sit together and watch um, uh, the Wiggles, and uh, Henry was her favorite character. That's Henry. And she, um, you know, kind of pointed that she wanted Henry and, and said, you know, in my head said, I want Henry. And so I ordered Henry, and Henry arrived. And she um, opened the box, and she grabbed Henry out, and she started um, running as best as she could. She's always been very, very awkward and, and kind of hypotonia, and screaming, Henry, Henry, Henry. And then, so that was very exciting. Um, and then her mom said, oh, I'm going to take Henry, teasing with her. And she screamed, no, 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 don't take Henry, bad mom. And it was just like, whoa, <laughs> you can talk. All right, great. This is fun. And so from that point, our house started being filled with different toys. I am not clinically trained. I don't really know the concept of putting a child on an extinction plan. I'm learning. My instinct was, well, if she wants to talk about and categorize the toys, we'll get them and we'll talk about them and categorize them. And she's always used these different characters, these different shows, in an interesting way to kind of navigate her world. And I'll show an example of that in a little while. But um, So that's Francis, and I lost my train of thought because I'm talking about my daughter. But um, yeah, so, oh yeah, so schools. This is, she was about four here. Um, and this was still just a little bit before anybody was giving us the word autism, right? And I know it seems in name that I wouldn't think of autism. But sometimes you just don't see it, even if you're studying it. And at that point, I, it had been made loud and clear to me by my department that I wasn't going to be promoted by studying autism, that they really wanted me to study basic social cognition, um, and when you're an assistant professor and brand new in a department, I was terrified, you know. And so I was taking myself out of the autism equation, mostly for fear of not being promoted. I hate to admit it, but also because it was such a complex problem, and people were already working on it and doing a lot better job than I was. So why would I, you know, why would I try to compete there when I could write all kinds of imaging papers about? the development of social cognition and typically developing kids. So I was out of the autism equation, and I went and gave a talk at Carnegie Mellon and met uh, Marcel Just. Most of my life, I would argue, most of my successes in life have been because I met the right person at the right time. I'm extremely fortunate. I think I have, like, help me written on my face somewhere, and so people tend to help me at really critical Annie's shaking her head, like, yeah, definitely. But, you know, I, I think that I, um, or said positively, I think I can be mentored pretty well to a point, and then I get very bullheaded. So I saw Carnegie Mellon, and in Carnegie Mellon, <clears throat> right about here on the back side, was this amazing school called the Carnegie Mellon School. And while I was there giving a talk, the department head said something about, you know, we have a job opening, maybe you'd be interested in it. And, you know, like, you know, in the abstract, I'm perfectly happy at Duke, you know, but, you know, my daughter. And so he um, had me meet up with the, um, with Sharon Carver, who runs the children's school at Carnegie Mellon. This is the best school for the four to seven year age range that you can possibly find on the planet, I submit. I mean, it's, it's run by somebody who worked with Donald Hebb. 
um, and studied cognitive psychology and is fantastic with children. So she was given the opportunity to set up a school for kids. That's really perfect. And I was sitting in it and realized it was perfect for Francis. And so when I had the kind of debrief at the end of the day with the chair, I said, if you would, I know that spots are limited, but if you would give me a job and a spot for Francis in your school, I would move here. And I had some grants at that time, and so it was an easy sell. And so we moved, we packed up and moved to Pittsburgh. I think um, people on the outside that don't really know me very well, um, I've moved three times in my career, which is probably a little more than average for somebody my age. In each case, I was able to secure something I wanted for my family. Um, I think it's oftentimes seen as sort of political moving so that you can get more and more and more. And sure, I, you know, I understand how that system works in academia, and I've tried to use it in order to help Francis and help my um, sons. And so I you know, say that shamelessly. I think anyone in my position would. There are very few things that I'm particularly good at, but I've been blessed with being good at science. And so I've used that to get these, um, these opportunities for Francis. And Francis excelled at that school, and it was amazing. And finally, we got to see someone who started to use the word um, autism. I had teamed up with Nancy Minshew, another mentor, another person that I met at the right time. And she sent me to see, after meeting with Francis for a few minutes, just you know, on a, a Sunday afternoon, suggested I, I go see um, people at the Children's Hospital there in Pittsburgh. And we got a diagnosis of autism. And I was floored. I can't tell you how stupid I felt that I didn't see autism. You know, and girls don't get autism. It's, you know, it's a male to female ratio, and I could quote all the statistics, and she makes eye contact, and it's this and it's that. And like, no, I'm pretty, pretty sure she has autism. And you realize at that moment in your gut, you know, yeah, that's, that's absolutely it. Um, you know, and I still don't know how I feel about the diagnosis. You know, scientifically, what does that give us? But from a parent's point of view, it gets you a starting point um, and a name. It quickly becomes curse and a positive, but it sort of uh, gives you a place to start. So Francis has autism. Okay, next person in, in life that I'm meeting. First off, Bob Schultz had to decide to move to University of Pennsylvania, and Ami Klen had to remember that he reviewed that paper and had been following some imaging work. And so I got a call from Ami Klen, and probably everybody in this room knows who Ami Klen is. Um, fantastic clinician, fantastic scientist and a great person. And he said, we have an opening at Yale. And I recognized Yale as um, uh, it's a sort of funny story. When the START centers were funded, Carolina got one. Joe Piven and, and I were involved in writing that along with a, another group. It was my first grant writing experience. And I wrote the imaging project for it. And then um, Yale also got one. Yale put a release in the New York Times that they got the best score of all the START centers. That's kind of a Yale thing to do. And uh, you know, I was so mad because we'd heard each other's scores, and Carolina's was a little higher. I don't think Carolina got the best score either. And you know, Joe assured me it doesn't matter. That's just you know, Yale's prominent for autism. They need that. You know, we're not. Um, and so I was mad. And so I'd been following Yale autism and hoping we would just match them in every area. And science is about competition as much as it is collaboration. Um, and I wanted to win. And you know, so um, when my former nemesis called and said, would you like to come to Yale? You know, we have an endowed chair. That's job security. Um, and you know, we give you tenure. Um, and so I thought for about five minutes, and then I knew I was moving to Yale. Um, I loved Pittsburgh. I loved Carnegie Mellon. But this was a great opportunity. And I was like, well, you know, so went home and, and um, talked it over with family. And I was like, well, let's proceed with caution. And so Ami, being a brilliant clinician, knew that if he could just get Francis in the clinic, the deal would be made. And so I, um, you know, I knew Yale had like a two-year waiting list. And so I'm like, well, I'd love a second opinion on Francis. And so Ami Klen and Fred Volkmar became Francis's physicians. And that's like, you know, somebody, uh, I, I don't know anything about baseball. 
um, I played soccer. So that's like Pele coming in and helping out your kid with his you know, left foot. Like, okay, yeah, this would be great. So I go in, and they were amazing. I mean, it was just fantastic. And I knew at that point, well, this is a place that I can really build a program. This is, this is home. So packed up, we moved um, and settled in. And you know, I show this just because for the first time since Francis really started having troubles as an infant, it was happiness. You know, I was really seeing her improve. We had the right resources. Um, I am extremely blessed, and I realize for the other parents listening to this and in the room, the rest of you don't have Ami Klin to show up at your kid's IEP meeting. When Ami Klin and Fred Volkmar show up anywhere in Connecticut to an IEP meeting, the school does whatever they tell them to do if they have to move mountains. And one of the real challenges and frustrations with the school systems, and they, they, I believe they mean well, but for example, in Connecticut, from town to town, totally different philosophies. It is the truth that some towns, Guilford, Connecticut, and their school system are fantastic for kids with autism. They put a lot of resources into it, and that's where we chose to live for Francis. Other towns put the money into a legal defense fund so that when parents ask for things, they say, you'll have to sue us. And most of the time, the parents, while they're paying their property taxes, don't have enough money to sue the school, which has access to said property taxes, and is suing them for services. This is a major problem. I won't say a lot of political things today, but that's a major, it's disgusting. And so, you know, when fairly simple, nothing that Ami and, and Fred were suggesting was really outrageous at all, um, you know, make sure Francis has some one-on-one -on -one help. If a fire drill um, happens, make sure somebody walks out with her so she won't bolt. All of those little things, but I realize how lucky I am because of the science I do and the reputation um, of, of being invested in autism. And I wish every parent could have that. And so you know, that would be um, a major outcome. OK. So at Yale, we started um, what I didn't like about Yale's program and what I've had license to really do, Yale was renowned for diagnosis. Earlier and early diagnosis, better and better diagnosis, taxonomy, figuring out how to cut up the meatloaf, um, you know, what are different types of autism, all of that. Very important stuff, but what we weren't doing was treatment in any real way. So if you have early diagnosis, why not early treatment? If you have strong genetics resources, Matt State, why not genetics on everyone? If you have imaging, why not image every child that walks through the door, electrophysiology? Why not do it all, but use treatment as a natural experiment? Because we know enough about treatments at this point that we're not going to hurt any kids with autism with any of the um, uh, empirically tested behavioral treatments that have shown some promise. But what we don't know enough about is how those treatments work. We don't know about how any psychiatric treatments work, really, but particularly behavioral treatments in autism. So what we set up was a system um, with different components where we could keep doing the basic work of looking at social and cognitive functions and looking at their neural and genetic substrates, so mapping out what the brain does in typical development, looking at large-scale individual differences. And here, we're talking about trying to look at populations of individuals. So for example, if we want to make early diagnostic procedures, looking at those people with increased genetic risk, for example, infant siblings, is the first step. But if you want to make a real diagnostic test, it has to work no matter what your base rate is. right? So it can't just work on people for whom you already know they're at high risk. It's got to work on the low-risk kids, too. So we take a ep developmental epidemiological approach to much of what we're doing, which is consistent with where NIMH is headed in terms of an RDOC approach. You can do it all in one fail swoop if you throw out the notion that you should only focus on those with the particular disorder. So bringing in that aspect, taking our basic science, and trying to develop treatment protocols for specific targets, and this is borrowing um, from Dr. Enzel's um, championing of this, this idea that you can use neural systems level measures 
um, like the readout of an fMRI scan as your target. I want to show you a couple of examples of that. And then use these test efficacy, test target engagement. And if this works really well, you can roll out evidence-based treatment back at the population level. So this is the model of the work that we do. And this work is really based on the notion of um, not being happy with the services available to Francis. Um, you know, Yale had a great reputation for diagnosis. I want it to have a great reputation for treatment development and a unique kind of treatment development, not any one brand of treatment. Um, I don't want it to be associated with a particular form of ABA. I want it to be associated as the place that all treatments come, some survive, others ring the bell and go home. And we'll use cognitive neuroscience methods to really test. And then even those that fail, we'll know why they fail. And I think where this is going is most will fail for some kids. Some will fail for many kids. We can tell you why they fail. And failure is a great way to learn. So now, talking about individual differences. So I'm actually the father to two children who have had an autism diagnosis. Um, and autism runs strongly in, in my family. I have numerous um, um, uh, nieces and nephews. And um, so it's a family affair. But what fascinates me is the difference between, so there's Francis, and this is Lowell. Um, and he was diagnosed very early on as a result of being a, what I assumed was a typical kid in an infant high risk study, as being somebody to really watch, a great deal of concern. And that emerged into a PDD NOS diagnosis, um, which you know, I'll talk about as autism spectrum disorder. Um, not as severe as Francis. And um, very intellectually gifted, a um, little shy, a little nervous, a little awkward socially, and has lots of intense interests. Um, one of his intense interests is building things. Um, and he has you know, developed language quite nicely and has had massive, massive early intervention. I don't know if that took him on a different course, but he's definitely what people talk about as an optimal outcome child. So that fascinates me. And then this little guy, the ham of the family, this is Kenneth. If there's like the opposite of autism in some three-dimensional space, that's him. Most socially outgoing, gifted, he's going to be president. He watched this kid. You should start asking him for things now because he's going to be in charge. Um, not at all shy, fearless, absolutely fearless. So he. Um, very, very, very different. Siblings of Francis. So we are very interested in studying siblings. So for example, one of the earliest studies we did with imaging was to look at children with autism and their unaffected siblings. And the Simon Simplex collection made this possible. So we used imaging to look for state markers. So this is brain regions that show dysfunction in autism relative to unaffected siblings and typically developing kids. Trait markers, which I think are probably one of the most interesting aspects of this work, regions where unaffected siblings and their affected you know, child with autism sibling, where they share dysfunction. And then finally, what I think is really cool, what brain regions help you avoid the genetic risk for developing autism? How do you compensate for that genetic risk? And so we showed these simple biological motion figures. So seeing a person moving about playing patty cake, and then the scrambled version of that. And this is a beautiful probe for getting the brain to start doing everything it does when it processes social information. And we were able to find these regions. And you know, I'm going to give the, the more layperson summary. This, the state regions, these are all the usual suspects in autism. The STS, the ventral temporal lobe, um, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, fusiform gyri bilaterally. No surprise here. These surprised us, where they were located. Um, when you start looking at the literature and you do formal meta-analysis, it's really all the regions that come up across neurodevelopmental disorders. So uh, pick your favorite neurodevelopmental disorder. One of these yellow trait regions is in there. These are regions that are an endophenotype, um, by definition, for autism. 
but they're an endophenotype for other neurodevelopmental disorders as well. The first has depressed me because I would hope that you know, a genetic sig a neural signature for the genetic risk of autism would be specific. And then it occurred to me, well, why would it? No gene has ever been shown to be specific to autism. We inherit a risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. And this harkens back to um, cocktail party some friends threw for me. Cocktail party is too highfalutin of a word. A keg party that my friends threw for me after I got my PhD. And, you know, one of them was like, well, Developmental psychology, why did you do that? They just published the human genome. You're totally out of a job. And like, yikes, yeah, probably. Um, my backup plan is to open a coffee shop. It's still on the table. I might do that. Um, but really, we're not out of a job as developmentalists. That developmental perspective can answer the question of how do you come into the world with a set of genes that affects particular pathways, okay, so we can nail it down to particular pathways. But even then, we look across disorders and see that different disorders share risk and differences in those pathways. So it becomes a when and where question. And when and where questions are great in neuroscience and developmental neuroscience. And so I think um, you know, that's the answer to the friend who was concerned about my employability. Now, compensatory, this blew me away. If ever a developmental neuroscientist wanted to see two brain regions that show up in people who have the genetic risk for autism but don't express it. Ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the temporal parietal junction. Two regions that have been nailed down as being involved in high level theory of mind, reasoning about other people. It's tantalizing to interpret this as the siblings are accomplishing typical behavior but they're using a different set of brain regions that allow them to do it that are, are brain regions that we normally use for more high-level things than just processing whether people are moving in the environment and what they intend to do. So it gives you an insight into the life of a typically developing um, sibling of a child with autism. They might be doing a lot of work underlying that typical development that we're just completely unaware of. And imaging allows you to see that, especially developmental imaging. Now, everything I've said so far is totally not true for girls with autism. Um, most of the brain imaging studies that have ever been done, mostly boys with autism, it's not because we don't like girls, it's because they're hard to find for imaging studies. And they're also messy in terms of the diagnostic categorization. Very few people are great at um, the diagnostic care that has to go into kind of figuring out girls. So for example, when a boy presents and they're lining up trains, it's like, oh yeah, you know, obsessive interests. When a girl presents and she has 10 different dolls from the American Girl Doll Store, that's a true story for Francis, and she can tell you a lot about each one and they socially interact and she seems to be doing pretend play, like sitting them down in a row and teaching them as a teacher. Well, that's not going to get her qualified on the ADOS, you know, that's, or an ABI, um, but that's her version and many girls' version of a restricted repetitive behavior. Their fixated social um, cognition, they might talk about their friends, their place in social hierarchies, they're fixated on it, they have social motivation, but they're talking about it in a way that on the surface of it is like a little boy with autism talking about his trains, which is very easy to pick up as, well, that's a repetitive behavior. Okay. So this is just a slide showing you that as we've probed the genetics of, of autism in girls, we've seen that there's a difference in, in the underlying genetics, especially in the type of hit that you have to have. It seems that, you know, one of the best ways to avoid autism is to be a girl. And that plays out in the genetics, and that plays out in terms of the social phenotype in the brain. Here, girls with autism um, show robust activations throughout the social brain relative to, girl, to boys with autism, as well as to typically developing boys. Where they're different is in comparison to typically developing girls. Um, and as a father, that terrifies me. So we um, took... Um, you know, this interest in girls. And I found like-minded people um, at different sites when, when the Autism Centers of Excellence were being solicited. 
And so we have teams from, from San Francisco and UCLA, Matt State and Dan Geshwin, um, University of Washington with uh, Sarah Webb, Harvard with Chuck Nelson, Nadine Gabb, um, at Yale, um, Jamie McPartland and myself. We lost Matt State to San Francisco, so we added a site. Um, I went and looked for what I thought was the very best team that I could possibly assemble to get one of these networks to focus on girls. And that was one of the most exciting grants I've ever written. Uh, you know, it was so much fun to learn things from Dan Gashwin and Matt State. They're extraordinary. Um, and we're in the middle of it right now. And I can't wait to show you kind of the integration of genetics and imaging and behavior and you know, we, we very quickly realized that we couldn't just use the gold standard diagnostic techniques. So we threw in in our sample populations of girls that um, might normally be missed. And we're trying to understand where they fit in. So stay tuned for that. In another year, those papers will be coming out and describing what we're finding. It's very, very exciting. I think this is the largest collection of girls with ASD as well as their unaffected siblings. Um, and it's also a huge collection of boys with ASD. And so we'll be able to find out a lot about sex differences. Okay. So I told you my dream, really, when um, interacting with Francis is what, what can I know that from science that would allow us to develop better treatments? And so we went a couple of different directions. Um, one was to go after... Um, pharmacological manipulations. And one of the ones, um, oxytocin, intranasal oxytocin, was something that was being talked about by a lot of people in the popular press. There had been some brilliant science done on this, Tom Enzel doing most of that brilliant science. Um, and it was very attractive to autism researchers to go after this. I was actually very suspicious. My understanding was that oxytocin doesn't get into the brain if you spray it into the nose. Um, and so, but I had you know a couple of colleagues that I respected and a postdoc, Ilanit Gordon, who kept chasing me around wanting to do an oxytocin study. And I finally gave in. And I gave in because I had been getting lots of emails from parents saying that they had bought intranasal oxytocin online and they were giving it to their child and they think they really see a difference. I can assure you um, while I have a public platform, if you buy oxytocin on Amazon.com, by the time it arrives at your door, if it ever was oxytocin, it will no longer be oxytocin. And that simply spraying it then into the child's nose is going to do nothing, and it may be harmful, because depending on what it used to be before it wasn't oxytocin. So please don't think I'm endorsing in any way intranasal oxytocin as a treatment for autism. That being said, our data were interesting. Um, so we gave oxytocin once to kids with autism or placebo, double-blind placebo-controlled study, prior to going into the scanner. So remember, we had a particular target, and our target was the social brain. We wanted to see if oxytocin would alter the social brain function in response to simple stimuli like these. Look at the eyes and tell me whether they're hateful, thinking about something disgusted or worried. And then a non-social judgment. Look at the headlights of the car. Tell me if it's a sports car, SUV, truck, bus. Kids in the magnet made sure they could do this task. When we looked at oxytocin versus placebo, exciting from the point of view of relative to placebo, we had much more activation in these classic social brain regions, also in reward centers, in, in the presence of oxytocin in response to the social stimuli relative to the non-social judgment. In placebo, we saw what we would normally see with reference to typically developing um, individuals. So reduced activation in autism, some but reduced, particularly when compared to on oxytocin. Lots of interpretations for this. I'm not getting, gonna get into that. But one of the um, sort of exciting findings was in particular, there were regions, especially regions that are well known for processing reward value of stimuli, and their connectivity to these temporal lobe regions involved in processing um, social meaning were increased, but only for the social stimuli by the presence of oxytocin versus placebo. So what do I make of this? It's interesting to me. You know, Obviously, the next step in oxytocin research will be to 
develop compounds that you can take easier to deliver than intranasal oxytocin that alter oxytocin centrally. But even more so, I think, is the contextual nature of these effects. There was a paper in Nature about a week ago showing that you actually increase um, uh, dislike for the outgroup in the presence of intranasal oxytocin. The very subtle, from the beginning of this research, it's all about the context. So this should be um, very important for autism, not just studies of oxytocin, but drug studies in general. There's a model where I think where experimental therapeutics is, is pushing us to control the context under which the drug is delivered. So instead of having a study where they come in, they get three doses about the same time of day for six weeks, there's a little bit of measurement of what treatment might be going on in the background, but it's an FDA drug trial focused on the drug. I think where we'll gain much more leverage is if we team up neuromodulators with specific empirically-based behavioral approaches so that we can control the social learning that happens, give whatever compound we think of as a neuromodulator, a cognitive enhancer, social cognitive enhancer, in the context of that training. And that's when I think that we'll actually see some really cool um, effects and some synergy between the neuromodulator and um, the behavioral treatment. But I want to show you some work that we're most excited about right now, simply looking at a behavioral intervention. So pivotal response training is one form of ABA that has been expanded to be much more general and much more targeted towards generalization and natural environments than what you typically think of as ABA. So my colleague, Pam Ventola, has led this work. She's a new assistant professor at Yale and one of the smartest hiring decisions I've ever made. Um, this is Hannah, one of our research assistants. She's working with a child with autism. So this is what pivotal response All training right, looks like. More. She's Ready? really hoping yeah. to get some eye oh, contact. There's plenty in here. Doing something that the child really likes to do. Clinicians okay. in the room, you've yeah, seen this. Parents yeah. that have, have worked in this type of um, treatment, <laughs> it's very familiar. So doing something that's very, very engaging. Here's another little girl with autism. Here you a go. A little girl with autism. It's always risky to do in a talk. Anybody notice any differences between those two kids behaviorally? Shout out. Yeah. And it's I was wrong, boy, but yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second boy was more jumpy. That was what I was looking for. More jumpy. OK. So we've looked at and scanned pre and post about 24 kids, 46 years of age, um, moderate to high functioning um, autism, and very well matched for IQ and whatnot against a weightless control group and against a typically developing group. Now, the results, let me just show you, you know, I always kind of, with a grain of salt, Another episode with um, you landed Tyrone. on a lily pad. You get this is after um, six to eight weeks of treatment. Eye Let's contact. That's what we were looking go for. Again. So you get another turn. Turns out on behavior, these kids do a lot better. This is nothing new. Actually, it, it is a bit new in the sense of we're very rigorously testing a form of ABA. Um, I hope I don't anger people, but. I would argue that these forms of treatment, with some exceptions like the Denver model, have not had the type of scientific scrutiny that they deserve. So first thing we wanted to do was see if in our hands, you know, sort of calling our shots with an outcome measure like the social responsiveness scale, 
could we see a difference? And the answer is yes. So they, they work. They work for some kids. They work a little bit for most kids. They work great for a few kids. So this is showing you that the total SRS score goes up. Um, and every subdomain of the SRS adds to this. And it goes up very nicely. So behaviorally, it works. The brain findings blew us away. So the kids came in differently um, from the start. So about half the kids, it's nice when that works out that way, about half the kids totally defied everything I believe about social brain function. They were hyperactive in social brain function. So that was problem number one. Oh boy, no, the, the result's not going to replicate. The other half of the kids beautifully behaved. Um, their brains showed really nice hypoactive results. The, um, this didn't vary by boys and girls. There's a mixture of boys and girls in here. So it wasn't that. Um, but when we started studying this, my postdoc, Daniel Yang, um, wouldn't accept my solution, which is let's just reanalyze the data, make sure we're not making a mistake because we can't be wrong. He kept saying, I already analyzed it. You know, It's not wrong. But I've noticed, having seen a few of these kids walking down the hall, that those are the hyperactive kids. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, don't say another word. So we got the clinicians to code um, blindly which kids were you know, exhibiting different behaviors and, and giving us um, their input. And then we looked in that for you know, verbiage like hyperactive, hypersensitive, all over the place, things like that. And it turns out that our brain imaging data lined up beautifully with the behavioral impression of um, very difficult to manage clinically, kind of very um, all over the place. So we think we found two biotypes. One, a very classic picture of autism, not interested in the social world, social brain hypoactive. The other, strongly responsive to all stimuli, social or non-social, all over the place. So there's this whole, um, I believe it's been popularized too much, but there's, you know, kind of no sort of an intense world um, these are certainly kids that are like Frances, as I mentioned earlier. Um, social hasn't been her problem. The intensity of the world seems to be her problem. So for example, her biggest fear in life is the birthday song, which has an element of social, but also attention placed on her, and she will run across a crowded street very rapidly if she hears the birthday song. So I think she's one of those hyperactive kids. Um, uh, forgot the punchline. Their brains all ended up in the same place. Okay, They all ended up more like typically developing kids. I was disappointed in that because I wanted to see some compensatory activity. That would have been scientifically very exciting. But the way they ended up in that same place differed over time. Um, so through repeated scans, what we were able to see is when the hypoactive group normalized, it was the result of an increase in activity in the ventral striatum and the amygdala, very class and nucleus accumbens, classic regions involved in reward and motivation, and their functional connectivity to the rest of the social brain, but only in that subgroup. In the other subgroup, reduced activity in the thalamus and its relays to primary sensory areas as a result of the treatment. Um, leading to, in the end, brain differences that were basically indistinguishable and indistinguishable from typically developing. And these kids, you know, were doing quite well. We didn't cure autism. That's not something we talk about. But we alleviated a great deal of symptomatology, and the brain followed suit. This shouldn't be surprising. All behavior comes from the brain. But what's important about it is that we can say, well, these kids are different at the beginning, now in our next study, what if we modify the treatment for the kid on entry into the scan? Because you can see these things at the level of individuals. Because we've scanned so many kids, we know what kids should look like almost in a growth chart kind of way. And so we're hoping to test that next and actually alter the treatment, have different arms, depending on who, um, who comes into the door. And what we're finding is that the therapists did that anyway. Even though there were strong guidelines, we don't mandate every word that is, is being said. So for the hyperactive kids, um, and, and the very difficult to manage clinically, 
the therapists were working quite a bit on emotion regulation and aspects of that, whereas for the less socially motivated kids who were very easy to interact with, very calm and subdued, they were working more on eye contact and improving social motivation. So, okay. Now, I've been spending too long on science. Um, let's get back to Francis. So Francis now has been doing great until fairly recently. She had her first seizure, and I, you know, only a scientist dad would take a picture of his daughter the night after the seizure. But um, it's a scientist dad who has access to Laura Mint, who's a fantastic um, child neurologist and took care of Francis. And this was me. This was the longest night I've ever spent um, because I was a, I, I'm not an MD, and I you know, assumed a seizure um, could be life-threatening because of what you can read on Wikipedia. And so I stayed up all night watching Francis, and I took pictures of her. Every time I thought her skin looked a little blue, and sent them to Laura Mint, who undoubtedly woke up every time, looked at the picture, and said, you don't have anything to worry about, Kevin. And then she was very nice about it. But um, Frances had a seizure while she was at school in math class. Math is a very stressful class for her. Um, one of her crushes is in there. And she um, had a seizure and it was her first. And this is her getting tested the next day after a sleep deprivation period. And you can just see the fear. Frances lost a lot of gains after that happened. Um, and that's common as I understand it now. And, and Francis was, was going through puberty, which is, I understand now, common for a first seizure to happen. Um, and the statistics are very comforting, but it was a very, very, very scary period. And again, I felt like a heel because I had excluded systematically all kids who have had seizures from my imaging studies for the past 10 years because that would make the data too messy. And I apologize for that because you could really learn a lot. Um, so, we study seizures now, and um, in particular, this sets up for me talking to you about a very particular form of autism, um, severe late regressive autism. This used to be called childhood disintegrative disorder. It's very, very rare. Now we talk about it in more dimensional terms as kids who are typically developing for a long period of time develop language or doing really well and then regress. And so. I want to talk about those kids and tell you about our efforts to scan these kids who almost always have very, very, very low IQs um, after the, the events, after the regression. Um, and, you know, it's interesting from a kind of a geopolitical point of view. These are the kids that most make you concerned about environmental influences, um, you know, vaccines causing autism, these types of things, because they were typically developing and then something catastrophic happened and now they have autism. Um, so we looked at these kids through imaging and through genetics and I think you'll be interested in what we found. So this is a great finding um, from a Wellesley paper in 2013 showing that when you look at gene expression and you do co-expression network analysis in autism you find prefrontal and primary motor um, cortex, layer five and six, um, early, uh, mid, early to mid-fetal development. So what was brilliant about this paper is it nailed down in kind of the, the average cases of autism when and where in terms of brain development, right? And it actually puts to rest a lot of questions um, that are tricky questions and says, you know, genetics, early in development, early in fetal development, relieves parents of a lot of pain of did I cause this, you know, still aspects of any time I go to the grocery store. Well, if you were only more this, your daughter would be less out of control. And it's like, no. Um, so great, great paper. We did the same thing in our cohort of CDD families. And so we had 32 CDD families. This is a disorder that appears at a base rate of about 1 in um, 100,000, so extremely rare. Um, the gentleman who ran the Child Study Center long before I arrived, Donald Cohen, had a strong interest in this and started cultivating these families. So we were able to go back and we were able to look at their brain, wide age, age ranges um, in that data, and look at their genes and try to find genes for severe um, late regression. 
and we found a collection, and when we seeded it with high confidence autism genes, we found that they tended to be expressed in different places than other high confidence autism genes. So CDD genes are being expressed in the thalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, and cerebellum, as opposed to prefrontal cortex, and later, mid to late fetal development. Um, about the time we started doing this study, we had some other data available from Nanad Sestin's lab. So we can look at more carefully at a wider set of brain regions and look where these CDD genes are expressed. And one of the interesting things that we found was, again, confirming um, the uh, cerebellum, um, thalamus uh, connection, the hippocampus, striatum amygdala, but seeing an overexpression of the CDD genes earlier, um, later than, than typical autism, normal autism. Um, and then another overexpression in the amygdala and hippocampus fairly late in development. So this is well past birth um, in age ranges of where you tend to see the common, we most commonly see the severe catastrophic regressions. So ages six, seven, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Now, so that was exciting, but does it map on in any way to brain? So we, to do that, we needed to scan these kids, some kids, some adolescents, some adults, all with um, intellectual functioning in the severely intellectually disabled range, nonverbal kids. And so we went through um, all kinds of procedures to get these kids scanned, including a lot of mock training, putting them um, through what we were going to do, and practicing. And we were able to scan most of those kids. When we did, we did a very classic face versus um, uh, place comparison, which gives you beautiful signal in the social brain. Um, I was particularly interested in hitting the amygdala, and this is a great way to hit the amygdala. Now, what we found is that in um, hippocampus, cerebellum, thalamus, we were seeing the same regions that were implicated by the genetic analysis, completely separate data, playing out in terms of where in brain function these CDD, CDD kids, these severe late regression kids, are showing brain dysfunction, in this case, too much activity in response to a face versus a house. Um, we also eye tracked them, and their eye tracking patterns are different than, um, if, I, you know, if I may, run of the mill autism. Um, so this is a very classic finding, high functioning autism, looking um, pretty equivalently at eyes and mouth less at the eyes than typically developing people. So typically developing people, high functioning autism. Low functioning autism actually doesn't really follow that classic um, uh, eyes-mouth distinction, probably because of not using the mouth to facilitate social communication. CDD kids make great eye contact, if anything a little more so than typically developing kids. So we're putting them together in a spectrum but these kids are actually showing some really interesting properties. Different brain areas affected, different genetics, different eye tracking patterns in terms of quantifying the social phenotype. Okay. So that's become a major aspect of our work. Stay tuned. Um, I'm really excited about those particular findings, particularly given I think it's one of the first times we've seen convergence between a genetic prediction of where you should see a difference in a subpopulation of people with autism, and then seeing that on functional imaging, um, that predicted difference. That convergence is unique and in a subtype because we have to deal with the heterogeneity of autism in order to begin to make progress in terms of treatment. So last thing that I want to tell you about. This is Francis. Has a very, very little baby playing with her, trying to help her learn how to roll over. So, you know, one of the things that most haunts me is why didn't I know, you know, early on. Um, I had worked with Grace Baranek, who was a graduate student, coding videotapes of, of early interactions. You know, why didn't I know? So we developed the methods to scan babies, both with optical imaging, which you see here, a little hat they can wear and actually interact with people, and with fMRI. That's Lowell getting his first fMRI scan. Um, and, you know, we've developed a marker using this biological versus scrambled 
where we can tell the difference between high and low risk kids based on whether or not they're a sibling, a child with autism. High risk, they're a sibling, they have an older sibling, low risk, they don't. And we're able to see that simply by measuring the blood um, oxygenation level response over this STS region that's become so important to us, um, even at you know, three months of age. So very exciting work. You have to point out, though, that this is just measuring risk. Most of the kids in this sample won't develop autism. I want to know why. Like why, if you're coming into the world early on, according to every developmental theory we have, you should sort of, your behavior should be canalized, and you should become more likely to develop autism. But there are some kids that jump that trajectory. I'd love to know why. Um, so, you know, it's such an obvious scientific question, but we tend to focus on um, other aspects. And actually, I lied. I want to, tell you, I want to show you one other thing. Um, so Frances now is very much a young woman. Um, she has always, so she's 11. She's become interested in boys, which I'm dealing with. One of the things with Frances, um, she, we talk about everything. And so now we talk about her crushes. And don't get me wrong, Frances doesn't really have, or, or dad doesn't think she has, a concept of exactly what a crush means, other than, for whatever reason, she's interested in that boy. So whereas she used to collect um, uh, toys and different you know, uh, stuffed animals, American Girl dolls, now she collects crushes. So she downloads pictures of you know, all the guys from Greece. She has a crush on most of the guys from Greece, except for John Travolta, because she thinks he's too goofy, goofy looking. And she puts them on her walls, and she lines them up. And this is quite the experience, you know. I could deal with little lining up dominoes and knocking them over and kind of thinking that was really cool. You know, I could deal with having to buy all the Teletubbies and, you know, the collection and then finding a place to put all of them. It's different to kind of worry about how is she going to navigate this because the boys haven't gotten interested back yet. I've got a couple more years. So short of buying guns, um, you know, there's like, well, how do we, how do we kind of navigate this? And these are this is pictures of Frances with some of her friends. This was her first day of middle school. This is as close as I could get, and he, she wanted to ride the bus. And so she's been doing really well at these things. So Frances loves now Greece. And I'm like, why does she love Greece? She watches it over and over and over again. And, you know... What else would you watch to kind of figure out the world of boys and girls and um, cliques in the school and how you fit in and how do you become a pink lady? And, you know, fashion is a big thing for her. Um, and so, you know, I love taking her shopping for cool sets of clothes. Everything seems to turn out pink. Um, but, you know, so that's what she's doing these days. You know, and you look at this and you kind of think about the brain. You know, how does... One of the things I worry about, and one of the things that's come up since middle school, is social exclusion. You know, and I, it hurts for me to watch her get socially excluded. She's a little strange. Um, she's very lovable and very friendly, but she can quote Greece all day. And if you ask her a question, she'll answer it by quoting Greece. That's going to get her into trouble with other girls who are much more sophisticated. And so, um, and she tends to have imaginary friends that she talks to. And so, you know, we've been doing studies where we look at social exclusion. And the brain, brain science can tell you a lot about what happens. And specific to autism, why um, kids with autism might be upset when they're socially excluded. So Cyberball is this game that cognitive neuroscientists have come up with to study this. And you have somebody play with two other players. You just throw them a ball. And every so often, they exclude you. And what's really brilliant about this is that it, it actually leads to brain changes in regions that process pain. And so the, the argument has been that they're feeling the pain of social exclusion. We thought a, a, an important game for autism would be cyber shape, where there's a rule if you know, your ball is a green diamond, you throw it to the guy with the green diamond. If it's a blue circle, you throw it to the blue circle. And now... If someone's excluding you, it's nothing personal. They're breaking the rule, right? Or there's another layer of it. And you might guess that in the case of typical development, it's the social slight that really gets these pain centers activated. 
In the case of autism, it's actually they broke the rule. And so, again, same result, same behavior. You know, I felt bad, but different brain, okay? And sort of challenge you to think about that in terms of um, trying to understand people with autism and where they're coming from. Um, the very last thing I want to say is a shout out to Kenneth here, who really has to deal with having a dad that studies autism, a sister with autism, who embarrasses him at times, frankly, and he wrestles with feeling embarrassed because, you know, his dad's not embarrassed and he's, he's trying. And he's a very sensitive young guy and he actually has a theory of autism that it's all about anger issues. Because the most important aspect to him is when his sister loses her temper. And this is a pitch for more studies of emotion regulation and autism, frankly. And I think Kenneth is on to a very good idea. And this is just to tell you that, you know, there's a lot of hope here for people with autism who have um, some fairly strong verbal abilities. Cognitive behavioral therapy, this is my colleague um, Dennis Godowski's work. Um, we're doing this in the context of an RDOC study, but we have individuals with autism coming in as well because we don't exclude anybody. We want all of the different um, diagnoses involved. And when we give cognitive behavioral therapy to work on anxiety and emotion regulation, we see in these individuals these incre beautiful increases in prefrontal cortex activity and regulation of these lower limbic areas. So, and these are in older adolescents. The same is true of adults with autism. So I want to leave you um, with, uh, with this. So um, Francis is now part of a huge blended family um, of five kids and two adults, and she's doing great. Um, I want to leave kind of the, or, or start the scientific argument that we actually know a lot about cognitive neuroscience now. If we keep going in the direction that we're going in, cognitive neuroscience of autism, we can use it to more effectively develop therapies that will help children across the spectrum and across the age range. And probably the most fertile ground will be adults with autism. And we can do a lot in adolescents and adults, especially young adults, um, who, where we can still connect with them by virtue of leaving school and, and possibly going into um, uh, college and their first jobs and, and facilitating that. So very, very exciting times. I'm very hopeful. I um, feel like I'm getting old because I guess I've been in this business now for 11 years. So every time I see Francis, I'm reminded of how long I've been doing this. But um, yeah. And I really appreciate you letting me talk about my family. And there's Frances, and you know she never saves anything for the swim back. So I'll leave you with that thought. Maybe we could take a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. Yeah, so the question was, the population of kids, not everyone with autism makes very poor eye contact. Um, are they showing higher levels of social functioning? So, and there's sort of two answers to the question. One is, let's, let's pretend no major interventions. When you look at very young infants and you follow their eye gaze over time, it is the case that the amount of appropriate eye contact measured with eye tracking predicts later social function. And so that's the purest answer to your question. The other answer to it is there's so much intervention going on that sometimes eye contact will be made, but it will have a different character to it. So even though the eye tracker scores it as they hit the eyes, in actual interaction, it's behind, it seems like a stare through as opposed to true, because it's not accompanied by changes in facial expression. And in that type of eye contact doesn't do a good job of predicting. So the study that you need to do to understand the role of eye contact in the development of social function is the prospective study.
Thank you so much. I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to make a comment and ask several questions, but um, I'll do as much as you'll let me. Uh, first of all, I'll take a bullet for my nine-year-old with autism boy, for sure. So I think it's not <laughs> just a bad daughter. It's my son, Benzie, I would definitely take a bullet for. But I wanted to make three questions. I wanted to ask you, everything I've read about girls and autism is that the sensory issues are so much stronger. And is that what you were talking about with the birthday song and that she can't handle all that emotion and attention towards mm -hmm. her? Is that the sensory piece? Because the things that's, I've read about girls is that the, the pronounced piece is sensory. That's the way I interpret it, that the reason she doesn't like um, that is the feeling of all eyes on her and the overwhelming, she's just, a, you know, it's hard for her to articulate it, but she's afraid of the song. I think, um, not to be too Freudian about it, but and not Freud, but um, I think what happened was her first birthday, um, we tried to throw a huge party and have every member of the family and every friend on the planet come over because we were so excited. And we kind of forced her into this social environment without really knowing about her vulnerabilities yet. And it overwhelmed her, and I don't think she remembers it as something that overwhelmed her, but just never, it, it, you know, when the, when the context happens again, she's terrified. So. And just two more quick questions. Um, where do you see as OCD coming into this um, uh -huh. interplay? Um, and then if you want to just add, um, the last question is, so my son scripts also all day long. Uh -huh. um, videos and it is the hardest part about play dates and yeah. other things. I've been told to try Namenda. Um, I was also wondering if you have advice about interventions, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, about the scripting. And Temple Grandin's mom said she only let her script or stim for 20 minutes. To uh, treat the scripting? Yeah. I'm of two minds about this. Um, Yeah, most effective story. Yeah, I think it'll be okay. I'm of two minds, um, and actually, Francis's mom and I disagree very strongly about this. Um, she definitely wants. She's a teacher, and definitely wants to treat the scripting, end it, stop it. Um, I grew up a Vygotskyan theorist, um, you know, back in college, and so I was very interested in how you take scripts from the outside world and narrative and internalize it so that you can understand your external world. Um, and that's a normative developmental process. It's a stage in language development. It's what has been argued from a, from a social cultural point of view as something that's unique to humans, being able to do that, and informing your world as a result of it. And so I have a little girl who does that. She doesn't know that it's embarrassing. Maybe she doesn't care that it's inappropriate to do that out loud. But if she were three, we would be cheering her on. It would be called pretend play. And if you know, we were a Vygotsky, we'd realize that every time a person learns something new, you know, try programming a complex VCR for the first time. All of the talking you do to yourself out loud as opposed to internal. So I think a lot of it may well be using those narrative devices to figure out the world. So for example, Greece, what an ancient story. You know, that's, that has just about everything in it. Families, arguing, gangs, interactions, geopolitics, love, Romeo, Juliet. I mean, how many times has that story been told? And how many of us use rich stories and narrative to understand the world all the time? I mean, most religions have a story that you use to understand the world. Why do we call it um, scripting or give it a negative connotation if it's being used in a functional way to try to understand the world? I don't mean functional way in terms of looking normal. You know, I mean like if it's working for them. And so I promised her I wouldn't tell the story, so I'm not going to. <laughs> you want to address Namenda and OCD? Oh, yeah, OCD. Um, you mean in Francis's particular case? Uh, yeah, I mean, both my kids seem to have OCD as a big part of their personalities, and I was just wondering yeah. how that intersects with autism. Oh, it, it absolutely does. Genetically, brain systems-wise, in every way, scientifically, I can tell you, it interacts. You know, we tend to call 
those types of behaviors in the context of autism, autism, part of autism, but in isolation they could probably meet diagnostic criteria for OCD. I don't know how helpful that is. You know, it's sort of, well, okay, they have two disorders instead of one. But the underlying mechanisms is what I, what I want to focus on. And, you know, if they're different in autism versus you know, pure OCD, that would interest me. But otherwise, we would approach them with the same um, analytic strategy and the same intervention strategy. So, and, you know. Uh, and lastly, it, Namenda. Lastly, what? Namenda, the drug for Alzheimer's that they're now using for kids with autism. I actually don't know anything about it other than what I've read in the press, so can't really comment well, on thank it. Thank you so much. Okay. This has been wonderful. Thank you. And with that, let's... Uh...